It is? Yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Judith Rose, Acting Cultural Counselor of the French Embassy and Acting Director of Villa Albertine, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Villa Albertine's headquarters this morning. I'm also very pleased to welcome everyone joining us online, thanks to our wonderful partners, Paul Round, the Centre National de la Danse in Pantin, and the Centre National de Danse Contemporaine in Angers. For decades, exchange between France and the United States in the field of dance has been thriving. The shared artistic influences of our two countries have nurtured new generations of artists, cultivated new relationships, and encouraged dynamic cooperation between both individuals and institutions. Lucinda Childs, whose dance opened Van Cleef and Arpel's Dance Reflections Festival last week with the Ballet de l'Opéra de Lyon, is one of many iconic figures who have come to embody this inextricable French-American connection. We hope to encourage further connections through our Albertine Dance Season, a 360-degree program that caters to each stage of the artistic process, from inception to performance and beyond. Since the beginning of 2023, Albertine Dance Season has allowed us to welcome numerous French artists, choreographers and dancers to the United States, either in residency or on tour. In that same spirit, it was important for us to include a moment to reflect together on the contemporary implications of dance, as well as on the nature and impact of transatlantic exchange in dance. Thus came the motivation behind this two-day symposium entitled Reciprocities, Making and Supporting Dance Between France and the United States. We hope that by bringing together key players in the fields of dance and performance from both sides of the Atlantic, we can build on the momentum of Albertine dance season and further encourage the creation of new partnerships and communities. Before I pass the mic to Noémie Solomon, allow me to say a few words to introduce her. Noémie works as a teacher, writer, dramaturge, and curator in the field of contemporary dance and performance. She serves as the program director of the Institute for Curatorial Practice in Performance at Wesleyan University. As a curator, her programs have been presented internationally, including at MoMA PS21, Istanbul Modern, and Gropius Bau in Berlin. In 2014, our team had the pleasure of collaborating with her on the collections Danse, an anthology and a catalogue published by Presse du Réel. This year, we have been honored to work with her again as both a lead partner on the advisory committee for today's symposium, as well as the curator of a series of several public talks called Dance Assembly. Last but not least, I'd like to express our gratitude to all those who helped organize this event, Noémie Solomon, the advisory committee, the artists present today, our colleagues at the French Ministry of Culture and Institut Français in Paris, and Howl Round for the live streaming. I'd like to thank Ardian, our leading sponsor for Villa Albertine Dance Season, without whom this event would not have been possible. I'd also like to thank the Arts Department at Villa Albertine, in particular Nicole Birman Bloom, Performing Arts Officer, who has been nourishing the dialogue for years with a deep personal involvement. I wish you all fruitful exchanges and debates. And Noemi, I leave you the floor. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Judith. And good morning. Thank you all for joining us as we begin this um, two um, or uh, these um, or two full days of exchange. Sorry, in the frame of this symposium titled Reciprocities. It's a pleasure to meet everyone here at Villa Albertine's headquarters in New York City, located on the unceded lands of Lenape Hawking, and we acknowledge and pay respect to the Lenape peoples, past, present, and future. 
So I was invited by Villa Albertine to work with a committee of experts, dancers, choreographers, curators, directors working across both sides of the Atlantic to discuss together some of the specificities, the pressures and desires that shape the dance field, a field that is composed of various communities, aesthetics, as well as by divergent infrastructures and resources. In many ways, we are at a critical juncture. With the challenges brought forth by the pandemic when it comes to social gatherings and sensorial intimacy, with the rise of social movements which have heightened racial and gender-based inequalities, dance practices and practitioners have had to, yet again, reinvent themselves. Dance culture is, we might say, well-versed in questions of precarity, of adaptability and sustainability. But these questions have erupted with a particular force lately, deeply affecting practices and entire ecosystems, often calling into question the very possibility for choreographic artists to make and sh share works with various audiences. In this context, how might we conceive of the role of international relations in dance? That is to say, how can we imagine and sustain a practice of global exchange in a time of many crises, a public health and social justice, as well as climate and funding crises? It became clear at an early stage of our conversation, which lasted over a year, that for exchange and cooperation to take place across borders, for it to be respectful and indeed generative for all the actors involved, it was vital to move away from um, uh, unilateral or even um, given habitual approaches. That the issue of reciprocity needed once again to be foregrounded and in fact embodied. And thus the title of the symposium, Reciprocity. So the etymology of the word refers to moving backwards and forwards, reverse the motion, rise and fall, a dance of sorts in which reciprocity emerges as that which cannot be still, stable, or taken for granted, perhaps. At stake then is not a, a this for that formula, but a practice, one that needs to be repeated, rehearsed, reaffirmed, a doing that moves between and is attuned to differences and to singularities to the needs and potentials of each other in relation. And so I hope reciprocities can act as a prompt as we gather here over the next two days, drawing on a rich tradition of choreographic exchanges between the United States and France, while imagining the relations and partnerships yet to come. Four different thematics will guide the conversation, and I won't enter in too much detail, but I'll just um, name there uh, them, them here. So first, pedagogy as performance. How might teaching and making dance inform each other? What are the possible spaces of collaboration between students, teachers, choreographers, and curators? Second, choreographing residencies. What infrastructures can we imagine to support artistic processes over long durations and extended geographies? Three, acts of transmission. What are the choreographic and curatorial strategies that can preserve and pass on various forms and movements across generations and cultures? And four, curatorial ecologies. What are the roles and social commitments of dance curators today? What are the challenges and opportunities in bridging local and international communities? So a rich agenda for us. The symposium is devised across four roundtables um, and four exchanges between choreographic artists titled Artist Provocations. So the roundtables are imagined as working sessions and we very much welcome questions, comments, suggestions from the audience here um, at Villa Albertine and also from those following us online through the HowlRound platform. The panelists would offer some thoughts or thoughts and contributions before a moderated conversation amidst the group. And after an hour or so, a respondent will open the Q&A question with the audience. 
the artist's provocations depart from or anticipate some of the problematics addressed in the round tables. These provocations put in relation artists working on both sides of the Atlantic around common concerns to make manifest perhaps some of the different realities that shape the respective practices. The aim here is to anchor our time together in artistic concerns and knowledges. So I'd like to thank everyone here for joining us um, this morning and throughout the symposium, and in particular the participants traveling from afar. I want to thank the members of the advisory committee for their willingness to share their vital insights throughout the process and to engage in conversations that have at times been difficult, but always richly rewarding. Um, I just want to name the members. I won't um, say the affiliations, but you can find them in the program. Tanguy Akar, Philippe Beither, Catherine Faudry, Céline Gallet, Linda Hayford, Serge Laurent, Angela Mattox, Sophie Myrtil McCourty, Emily Renouvin, Anne-Gaëlle Salio, Will Rawls, Catherine Tsekinis, Laurent Vinogé, and Tara Aisha Willis. I'm grateful to the whole team at Villa Albertine for the labor and the trust. Diane Joss, cultural attaché for the performing arts, Louise Daudet, who has done a tremendous job at organizing all aspects of this event, um, with the help of Nicolas Bluzet and Xenia Vlas Vlasenko. Many thanks as well to VJ Mathieu from HowlRound. Most particularly, I want to thank Nicole Birman Bloom. Many of, you will, many of you will know Nicole through her tireless work, her devotion to entire generations of artists across cultural and disciplinary borders. In many ways, the symposium draws on her expertise in the field, her ethos of listening, and her formidable resourcefulness when it comes to pe putting po people and practices in relation. <laughs> and so I sincerely hope we can use this opportunity over the next two days to listen, share, and imagine in common, perhaps come up with new modalities of assembly and working together in making and supporting dance. And so now I would like to invite the first panelists, along with Tara, Aisha Willis, dancer, dramaturge, writer, and curator based in Chicago, who will facilitate this first session. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good? Yeah? OK, great. Come on up. Let's all sit down together. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to keep my, my time clock there. There you go. Yeah, with the arms on it, the armchair, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm so excited to be on stage with these amazing folks um, uh, and, and to be able to be in the room with you all at this hour of, of this day um, in this context. Um, I <laughs> mean, uh, was invited to uh, guide this conversation um, and it's been really beautiful to reflect on it. It was sort of the one that I was like, why would you invite me to do this one? <laughs> um, but um, as someone who thinks a lot about the different uh, layers of our field, it, it actually feels really apropos um, uh, to sort of navigate it together with the, these folks, um, the way that education and pedagogy kind of filters through every single aspect of the scene that we're all taking part in, or the, scene, the many scenes um, of practice that we all take part in. And it's perfect that it's first, because I think that um, Education is the, the place that a lot of artists begin um, and a lot of people outside of pra artistic practice who are doing curatorial practice, who are doing administration and scholarship around dance begin with education and then circle back to over and over again as educators, um, as artists, et cetera. So it's, it's a beautiful thing to start here and then move into the other themes today. Um, so the kind of official description of this talk today, pedagogy as performance, I just want to read it so that we're grounded in it. 
What can hybrid spaces of learning, where pedagogy meets performance and vice versa, teach curatorial practices? What are the educational and experimental models that drive the development of creative campuses and dance programs on both sides of the Atlantic? Um, and we had a really lovely and complex conversation with this group of folks on a Zoom beforehand. And I just want to name two things that really surfaced during that conversation. And there's so many more things. Um, but two things that really came to the, to the center as kind of um, guiding intentions or ways that this, these, this set of questions emerges often. And the first is around kind of the logistics of bringing pedagogy and performance together. Um, the question of how curatorial and artistic goals end up in alignment or not with pedagogical ones um, within institutions, curricula, and programming. So how do we kind of think logistically about the way that pedagogy and performance actually like come into um, practical uh, alignment with each other? And then the second is around practices and the sort of mutual influence of pedagogy and performance. Um, not necessarily in terms of actual events or anything like that, but just how the practices for making and presenting dance and the practices for teaching students end up influencing each other. Um, how do we learn from one in the other, even if we don't actually create a program that does both at once? So I just want to name those two things that I think are underneath the conversation we're about to have. Um, and we're going to begin, as Noemi said, with um, just brief presentations from each panelist. Um, and I will name them, and then they will go, and it'll be very choreographed and beautiful. Um, and um, we're going to start with Joshua Lubin-Levy. Thank, thank you. OK, wow, well, it's working. Um, hi, um, I'm Josh Lubin-Levy. I'm the director of the Center for the Arts at Wesleyan University. Um, I've been in that role for a little over a year now. Before that, I was an adjunct professor at the New School. Um, I got my PhD at, at Performance Studies at NYU, but really, I'm a dance dramaturg. That's what I've been doing for over 20 years. And I, I like to say that because I think I bring a dramaturgical approach to directing the Center for the Arts at Wesleyan. If you uh, have been in the performance dance world, you probably know about the storied history of Pam Taji running the Center for the Arts at Wesleyan, doing an incredible job bringing dance there. Um, and we're in a transitional moment now trying to think about how a center for the arts at a liberal arts college can be centering arts and curriculum, not taxing an already spread thin technical staff who's also supporting students and faculty productions, wanting artists to have meaningful engagements with our campus, not just be dropping in for the weekend to perform, but actually there to work with students and develop their practice. And so these are big questions that we're asking, and I will offer um, a few thoughts that, that we have been kind of mulling about, as well as maybe a brief introduction, and I'll keep it really short. Um, I, I wanted to touch quickly on the creative campus phrase. That's really um, a concept that has been on fire in my mind, um, uh, thinking about the history of the idea of creativity entering campuses in the early 2000s, grants funding this idea that artists would bring creativity in really interdisciplinary spaces, in their collaboration, artists collaborating with um, faculty and uh, researchers outside of the arts in particular. And Wesleyan is a, a space that is very proud of being one of the early recipients of these creative campus funds and continues to run creative campus programming. Um, and I kind of think we need to shift away from what that creative campus model has been all about. Um, and so I woke up this morning and I, I, I wrote a little something that was maybe a little bombastic, but I'll share it just as a point of entry. We, we had a wonderful conversation about conservatories versus kind of liberal arts spaces. As a point of entry, perhaps we can oversimplify the question of performance and pedagogy by suggesting that there are essentially two models of performance pedagogy. There was a model of the conservatory, wherein the conservation of a specific discipline is fundamental to the training of students or disciples in a prescribed mode of practice. Conservatories are often protective of both the practice that they impart and the students that they train. Conservatories are often thought of as rigid, methodical, narrowly focused, exclusionary, and even ideological spaces of teaching as training. By contrast, the educational institution I work in, the liberal arts university, prevents 
present a performance pedagogy that defines itself in opposition to the conservativeness of the conservatory. If the liberal arts university could speak, it would say, I am multidisciplinary, I am innovative, I am against all disciplinary boundaries. I am driven by the notion that to be creative means to be inventive, to invent newness. I have a political belief that creative solutions are what the world needs today. I believe that the arts should be integrated with other modes of study. I prioritize process over product. I am both more in touch with the world and more independent from the necessity of living in it because my value is irreducible to the commercial demands of ticket sales and audience approval. I just feel like I hear these refrains over and over at the college campus. And, I, and with the creative campus especially, have found that there are these demands placed on artists when they come to our campus, such that they have to be multidisciplinary. They have to work outside of the discipline that they're in. Their innovations have to be world changing. It's not enough for them to make the small, minute observations of the scientists. They have to transform the world that we live in. Their transformations have to deal with all of the crises that the world is, are facing and that the crises themselves, the larger they are, the more justified the artistic practices. So there really isn't a space where someone is listening to and with artistic practice from inside of the university and being guided by where artists want to go. So one thing we're trying to do at Wesleyan is think less about artists in residence and more artists in partnership. How, as the director of the Center for the Arts, can I share leadership with an artist, marshalling the resources of the university to help them develop a research curriculum around whatever projects they might be working on, to be guided by the way that they want to work rather than asking them to ascribe to the way the university already works. And I actually think this is really fundamental to the way that Wesleyan has operated as a school. What's unique about, or what I, I find interesting about Wesleyan is that in the arts, Practice has always been prioritized in the artistic spaces. So um, in the theater department in particular, for instance, it's been around for many, many years. In the 50s and 60s, rather than the theater department becoming more of an English department that would study plays as texts, there were a lot of practitioners brought in to prioritize students getting the opportunity to put plays on their feet every single semester. That was a huge part of it. As a part of that, the dance department was created. Um, Cheryl Cutler was brought in at 21 years old to start the dance department at Wesleyan. And in 1978, when the university was making austerity cuts, as many universities were, I mean, I promise I'm about to end, um, uh, there was a huge student movement to protect the dance department and to protect Cheryl in particular. And I just wanted to end by reading this anonymous statement given to a student newspaper in 1978 at Wesleyan. This is from a student. There is a classroom on the Wesleyan campus which functions on the basis of cooperation and mutual effort. Each member of the class knows that she is an important element of the group and that the responsibility for making the class work is shared equally among all participants. Students are aware of each other's abilities and needs and are conscious of the importance of interacting thoughtfully. The classroom I am, des I am describing is the dance studio. I just think that's a, like such a beautiful statement from a student about the value of being inside of just the dance space. Um, and so I'm trying to find ways back into that kind of mode of practice as a way of guiding us towards other pedagogical outputs rather than asking artists to come in and innovate our sciences or innovate our math department or things like that. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Josh. Um, next we'll have Noé Soulier. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I direct the National Center for Contemporary Dance in Angers, in France, which is a, quite a special institution uh, because it unites um, a theater. We are responsible for the dance programming of, of this theater, which has three performing um, halls, one of 900 seats, one of 400 seats, and one of 100 seats. So we work with really different scales. And we also have a festival. Uh, it's also a, a choreographical center, which has, for most of its history, been directed by choreographers and not like by artists. One of them is Emmanuel Wynne, who is in the room today. It was founded in 1978 by Alwin Nicolais, and it has uh, supported American dance actually um, in a very successful way over the years. With 
from years of seminal works by Trisha Brown. New work was rehearsed and premiered in Angers by Merce Cunningham, by really important figures of American dance and also of, of international dance in general uh, and French dance. Um, but um, uh, so there is also this choreographic center where I am developing my own work and, and we have a team for that. And then we are also have, uh, it's also a resi resident residency place where we invite a lot of choreographers to make work, to rehearse, and we co-produce their work. And it's also a school. So we have a, a bachelor in contemporary dance um, with 20, 20 students. So it's a small, small scale uh, uh, program. But a lot of important figures from uh, dan dance in France have gone through that program, like Alain Buffard, uh, Jérôme Bell, um, Philippe Découfflet, to, to like name really different examples. Um, uh, but um, and I, I think the and also one specificity is we do not have um, permanent teachers. We only our faculty is only made of artists or practitioners or theoreticians that are active in the field and that we invite for duration from one day to one month or something like that. Um, and this allows us to invite the same person sometimes or often to teach, to create works at, at different times of the year and to show their works. Maybe just to give you an example now, um, we opened the season with a piece by Lia Rod Rodriguez uh, and Cantados, and she came for one month to teach the students in September from Brazil. And the students went to the school she created in a favela in, in, in Rio uh, in July. So, um, and we are working on trying to find funding for students from that school to come to Angers, uh, which is really important to us uh, next year or the year after if it takes more time to find the funding. Okay. Um, so, um, this is. And, and, and this has been an incredibly rich exchange, for example, with Leah. So I think we are in a very special place because we are not a conservatory uh, like the one in which uh, we, I, I train at the conservatory in Paris where, we, where Raphael is, is teaching. Uh, and we are not either a university. We are really just focusing on dance completely. And it's, it's really inside the theater. So it's quite... Um, but in relationship to the question of curating and, and pedagogy, there are a few problems that I have since I have I, I started in 2020, this direction, and I think I will never solve this problem, but I wanted to, to share them with you. I think curating in dance is radically different from curating in museums, because works are not available. I mean, not generally available. You cannot make an exhibition saying, well, I'm going to take that work and put it in relationship with that work. This is not possible because you might want to, to say, well, I want that Martha Graham work, but no one is dancing it at that moment. Like, the, you know, how do you bring the company? How do you, and maybe the company is not having this active in its repertory, and it's true for all kinds of work. So you don't have this availability of works. Another thing is in teaching, there has been this huge expansion of, what we call choreography and which choreographical techniques are important today, uh, which is amazing and kind of mind-blowing, but it takes time to enter in any dance practice. The body takes time, so you just cannot uh, cover that. There is no way. So you have to make choices, and these choices are extremely problematic. Um, so we try to broaden to not like kind of uh, stick to a kind of, you know, Western classical dance canon. We try to broaden that, but but how do... So, for example, there is Linda Hayford, which is also here today, uh, you came to, to teach also, uh, and Linda is part of Collective Fair in, 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 in Rennes, uh, who, who is... Um, um, a hip hop collective. I mean, not a collective. Sorry, Linda. You will tell it much better than. That. But there was also. I, I know that you were thinking about creating a school around these techniques, for example, and that you have much more expertise, for sure, and much more legitimacy to do that than we do, even though we are interested in in in, in sharing and in creating, uh, you know, exchanges as much as we can. But but we will never be able to be you know, uh, as deep as you can go in these techniques. So for me, that's another question. Uh, the, the body takes time and you cannot just teach everything. <laughs> um, and 
There is one thing, though, that I find very interesting and that I think is at the heart of dance teaching for decades and that is still present, which is that we, which doesn't happen so much in the visual art in the same way, which is that we actually learn works, learn. So you, no one will do a Jackson Pollock, you know, workshop learning dripping or anything like that. But people will do a Trisha Brown, a William Forsyth, a Leah Rodriguez, a, you know, workshop kind of entering in, in, in these practices. And this is really amazing. I, I mean, this is such a rich way of sharing uh, artistic experiences that I don't think happens in the same way in visual art schools. This takes time, but this creates really deep connections. And I think that's maybe one place where we can, I don't know, where, where dance can be creative, where dance campuses, where creative campuses, like what can be kind of labs, you know, where, where things occur, but it, the, the fruits of that are not immediate. They take a long time because it's really about like, you know, um, kind of digesting what has been made and, 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 and experienced by other people and then seeing how that, that transform what you do and, and, and that takes a little bit more time. So there is something about availability and time which is really, really different in, in dance as in uh, creating in the museum, let's say. Thank you so much. Um, next we'll have Raphael uh, Delaunay, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, so I'm Raphael Delaunay, I'm a French dancer and I speak much better German than English, but it's not going to be of any use today. <laughs> so I'm going to try in English, and maybe I'll switch to French, and I'll ask uh, Audrey to translate. Um, so élan means uh, momentum in French, which has, gives an idea of uh, daring, taking a risk, and of course, of movement. So, uh, Elan uh, was created in 2021 by uh, the CND. Uh, it's an idea of Catherine Sekenis. Uh, so, it's an école, uh, école de l'égalité des chances, and, and it's to open up some opportunities to young dancers, to, to give them a chance in the dance field, or not. And this or not is very important to us. So Elan is a space for inventivity, experimentation and research, and curiosity, uh, in order to allow uh, young dancers to discover and go through uh, some new path of uh, some new path and, all, and also to, I don't know how to say, tenter l'impossible, to dare the impossible. So this uh, program is a free cost and it's due to the Fondation Hermès, uh, the, the young, the young ac I would not call them students in purpose because they don't feel themselves as students and we don't see them as students. Though the young are very conscious of their chance that is given to them and especially because this program uh, came up right after the COVID. And that was for them like uh, coming out of the blue, like uh, something they always dreamed of without uh, uh, knowing that it would be possible. So thanks for the CND and to Catherine Sekenis for that. Um, so it was conceived and tailored. Oui? Because I say tailored because it's totally made sur mesure, like uh, haute couture. Um, for, uh, so uh, it's tailored for young, uh, young people that are still uh, in college or lycée and they're about 14, 15 up to 19. So that was the idea, but of course we had to extend it to uh, older people. 
but that was the, the specific idea. There, there had to be, it was uh, to be uh, before the Bash law. And it was also made for the, for the young that were um, coming from Seine-Saint-Denis. So the Seine-Saint-Denis is a department uh, which, uh, which had the specificity to have a huge mixity. And it is also, we used to stigmatize this uh, department. We say that it's the poorest department in France, but we forget to say also that that's the department that has the more uh, youth, the more schools, the more resources, the more uh, associations, and the more talents. But we had to extend also, uh, so there's also young people from Paris and abroad. Um, and uh, and Saint-Saint-Denis -Saint is a department also where there is a highest concentration of immigration. Boo. I shouldn't forget that there's a live stream. <laughs> Um, so, this program um, tries to respond to this question, and that this is a question that we address to the apprentices. apprentices. What do you need to allow yourself to think yourself as an upcoming artist? What do you need? And this program is, is, uh, is made to, to allow them to uh, à franchir le palier, to step, uh, oh my God, um, uh, to step, um, yeah, to, to uh, à franchir le palier, to step away, to take that chance, uh, and also what take them away from that chance. So we're we're there to to lead them to to go beyond their limits, and whatever they are. And they can be economical, social, mental. There's a lot. There's a lot of uh, front of uh, limits. So we're here to to help them to surprise themselves, to to discover what they know already without knowing it. To chatouiller, to to tickle their vocation. I like this word of vocation. Where does it come from? Where the, where's the uh, uh, roots of uh, vocation, and also to authorize themselves to think the impossible. Uh, so how a program can make the revolution in their way to, to think. Uh, so we choose the apprentice as much as they choose us, because they've heard about the, the quality and the diversity of the experiences they're going to go through. Uh, it's important for me to remind that when the, the apprentices get out of the program, they are the best ambassadors. So we work with conservatories of the department to identify the young that are po potentially concerned by this program. And it's uh, because it's important for us that the young, uh, that the, the future candidates are already engaged in a regular practice. So the audition uh, taking place under, um, um, no, the, the, actually the auditions are more like workshop that request the inventivity and their creativity so that Technique is not for us um, a criteria, a criteria. Yeah, sometimes I just have to say cry. Yeah, okay, uh, it's not a criteria, a selective criteria. Um, and the fact that the audition is a workshop, an open space for creativity, gives the, the program a certain color, a certain taste that we really, really try to stick on. Uh, so, with the idea that technical shouldn't be a, a refuge. A refuge. So we are very aware of the personality of the candidate. We observe his relationship to, to the other, to the space, to the, 
the, to the artist who is giving the workshop at, the, at this time. And we presume of what this program will bring to this young in order to, to sip and wear, to grandeur, and to suffer me. <laughs> um, in, a, in a fair relationship, give and take. It's very important for us to, to make this contract that it's free cost, this program, and there's no return to investment, but we, we need to feel that um, um, he will be very active in his, uh, in his um, engagement. Um, so in the audition, we have a talk with them and we ask uh, what you see you can bring to this program. Because it's, so it's important for us to, yeah, to set up this contract. Uh, that's uh, also to encourage the autonomy and the responsibility. The young is not, n'est pas mis en situation d'élève. He's becoming an actor of, uh, of uh, the successful of the of the success of the program for him, for the group, but also for the program. Uh, so uh, we study the resources, the economic resources of the parents, uh, but we are also aware of other uh, indices, indications. Uh, for example, uh, a young that uh, for us uh, seems to be a little bit stick to his uh, technique uh, that are taught in a conservatoire. We feel we feel that we need to help him whatever the resources from the parents are. And sometimes it's really look like, help, help. <laughs> um, da, da, da. Uh, uh, so another one which where we feel a lack of confidence. So we are as much aware of a young that have a lot of potential that uh, to a young that may have this potential, but it's not yet... Uh, Voilà. So very important also for me to remind that the, that the apprentice coming from different cultures of dance, classic, contemporain, jazz, hip hop, and even if the formation is um, affirms um, an, an orientation which is um, clearly contemporain, the, the boundaries beyond aesthetics are very quickly bur blurred, and also by the audition. We don't care where they're coming from, hip-hop, and that's not what matters for us at this moment. Um, so, um, that's a big statement. So, um, because it's also uh, a matter for them to forget what they, what they knew, to rediscover what they think they knew, they, they knew and um, voila, bref. So with Elan, we don't give uh, ourselves a goal. Uh, we don't have, a, we don't worry about efficacy uh, with predetermined stakes, uh, like a, a diploma. There's no nothing like that. Um, also, the, f the the fact that there's no restitution at the end allows us to se perdre. Yeah, to lose ourselves, to, 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 to try many things. Um, this allows any young to go to his own rhythm. That's very important. Uh, to take what's good for him, to define himself, his own stakes. So no evaluation um, makes the learning more peaceful, more joyful, and more satisfying. Uh, there will be a time for everyone. A chance for everyone to find his way. Um, it can be with, um, with um, a meeting with an artist or with a lecture or with a uh, performance. There will be a time for anyone. Uh, so I wanted this program the more uh, eclectic possible. Um, I make the, je fais le pari, uh, I, I, I bet. Ah oui, on peut dire I bet on, no? Ah, 
I, I bet on them uh, working aside, beside, uh, uh, on, uh, on periphery. Um, uh, uh, we, uh, um, allows, uh, allows you to, to progress in your own practice. Um, so, um, when Catherine Tsekenis uh, invited me to, to take the leadership of this uh, program, um, of course I had to, I had to, to re reaffirm my convictions as an artist um, so that it becomes a in feuille de route, well, a path for, for others, for young people. So, uh, it's, I, I, like, I like this format to, to, to faire école. Voilà, what, what, what is important to me, what, what for me was, uh, and especially to reconnect to the student I was, and to reconnect to the student I am still, somehow. And that leads me to the another um, well, that my engagement uh, in this program also uh, is coming from the fact that uh, I'm I'm learning uh, while they're learning, so I'm I'm doing the workshop with them, and that's a big statement for me. I, I wouldn't invite an artist where that I where I wouldn't be uh, um, I wouldn't like to put myself in. Uh, well, you got the idea, right? Sorry? Ah, salute. Oui. Um, so I, I put myself in the uh, auteur d'étudiant at the same high as the students. And this program that I dreamed of for them, uh, I want to follow, I want to follow it myself. And the, the, um, voila, I'm learning with them. Um, so I'm not thinking curating as a um, starting from the knowledge, but more starting from my career, my curiosity of learning. Uh, so I'm from starting from the student, I am still somehow. Voilà. Blah blah blah. Am I am I too long? Yeah, I have yeah. to. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I make <laughs> no, it. But, uh, so but it's perfect. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's a, a, there's a lot of uh, rencontres with des artists. So it's uh, there's a technique, there's improvisation, uh, atelier d'écriture, culture chorégraphique, exchanges, uh, compte rendu that they have a, they have a little cahier where they have to write down all the experiences they went through. Um, so I make a, a, a conclusion now. Sorry. So uh, this program is made to 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 sortir to stick out of the injunctions somehow, um, the results uh, should remain a surprise for them as for us. Uh, it's not predetermined. Um, so the, the, the research um, of your own truth uh, coming through the, the dance as a project, um, the joy, the non-knowledge, uh, a vulnerability, that is assumed and uh, that can produce uh, creativity. Uh, and I will just finish with uh, something that one of the apprentices said, yeah. So um, I can't remember her name, but she said, um, with Elan, I just spent a week where I, um, bon, je vais dire en français. Une semaine où l'on s'accorde une pause dans nos vies, où l'on apprend et où on se comprend. I like this sentence. Voilà. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll have last uh, Julia, Dr. Julia Ritter. Give me one moment to just um, negotiating many of these devices here right now. More technology than I realize. Um, Okay, this is on, yes. Hi, I'm Julia Ritter. I am the Dean of the Gloria Kaufman School at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. And uh, I'll just give you some quick background on myself because I think it just helps to position 
where I'm, my own positionality and where I'm speaking from on these topics. So I spent 23 years at Rutgers University in New Jersey, which is a public institution, um, which does have a conservatory, uh, School of the Arts. So I was at, uh, leading a dance department in a conservatory in a public institution. I left about a year, and actually it's four months, Stephanie, four months, a year and four months <laughs> that I've, that I've uh, been in LA. So relatively new in this position in Los Angeles. Um, USC is a private institution. Uh, the Gloria Kaufman School of Dance was founded in uh, 2012 with a transformative gift by Gloria Kaufman herself, who is still with us, thank goodness, and a tremendous uh, supporter of dance. It was kind of a game changer, I would say, in the United States that the establishment of this school. Um, those of you uh, that are, are well aware of kind of the, the politics and the goings on of, of dance and higher ed in, in the United States probably remember when it was announced, it was this big school and huge investment in LA and really going to change the face of LA in terms of creating a center for, uh, for professional dancers. Um, the, the school admitted its first cohort in 2015. Um, so we have thus far graduated five cohorts of students coming up on the 10th anniversary. Um, this is a, a, when it was first founded, I wanna give credit to Jody Gates uh, as the founding director and also to William Forsyth, who was the first endowed scholar, um, professor there. And they were both um, incredibly uh, um, involved in establishing the school as a conservatoire within this Research One University. Right, so um, it is an incredibly selective school. I've been through just one round of auditions so far in my new role. Um, and the dancers that come to this institution, I mean, we have hundreds and hundreds of applications and we typically allow, 20, we typically accept 25 a year. So it's a very selective school. Um, what is interesting to me though, um, getting to know this school is, of course it has changed over the almost 10 years that it's been in existence. Um, of course, when it was founded with, with Jody Gates and Bill Forsythe's um, expertise there, there was a lot of focus on ballet, but the school was founded with the um, intention of bringing different forms of dance together equally. Hip hop, Bollywood, jazz, tap, <coughs> ballet, contemporary, many that I'm not mentioning. Um, and that has continued to this day. And I would say the faculty um, and myself having come in as a new leader, we are even digging down deeper into what does it mean to bring all of those dance forms into conversation with one another. So I think it's also and the reason I'm giving this because I think it, it helps again, give you some foundation for how pedagogy and performance might be in conversation with each other. So when we audition for the Kaufman School, we are not looking for, which has been my experience in the past in conservatories, kind of a base level of ballet, kind of a base level of modern technique, right? That's been my experience at other conservatories. We're looking for kind of a kind of a standard. That's not the way that Kaufman auditions, which I find fascinating and also really exciting. We look for, in the, the, we invite 100 students out of the close to 600 applications we get every year, we invite about 120 to campus. So that means we review every single one of those 600 applications before we make the selection of students to invite to campus. Those students that we invite to campus, what we are looking to do is to create a cohort, 25 to 30 students, that excels in what they do already and is ready to take open new doors through what we offer them to gain experience in other things. That means we might bring in a dancer who's, who's, whose community has been a street dance community. They might excel in whacking or voguing. They might not have that much experience in ballet. So that is going to be a really interesting group of students that come together as a cohort to then go through creative processes and get to learn pedagogies. So that's been an ex uh, a really exciting experience for me. Um, to kind of watch how that develops. Um, the school offers all of those techniques, all of those techniques, ballet, again, I'll just try to run through them really quickly, ballet, contemporary, jazz, tap, Bollywood, dance hall, um, uh, numerous, numerous street dance forms, um, 
all of the students take all of these forms. They may start to specialize in certain forms the second two years if they want to, but they do are required to take all of these forms. Um, that, of course, can create different kinds of tensions for some students, right? Every, as we know, there's processes and ways in which um, forms are taught that some are more hierarchical, some are more community-based, but the students um, begin to learn what are the different pedagogies of these forms, how do I understand them, and then how does that also relate into the performances that they create with their um, artists. Um, the artists, the, their curatorial process at Kaufman is we have an artistic advisory committee. We also have a, an assistant dean of programming and special projects. So that assistant dean works with the advisory committee. We are not a presenting institution, but we do work very closely with um, the Arts and Humanities Initiative on campus, which is run by the provost, which is called Visions and Voices. So we work very closely with them to bring in outside performers. We bring about eight guest artists every semester to come and work, and it's a very short process. So um, those artists will come in from anywhere from four to six weeks to make works. Um, one thing that I'll put out there, um, and I, I don't want to speak too, too much about um, this, but I think it's important in terms of pedagogies and performance. We are in such a unique place right now, um, I think as artists and educators, and Noemi uh, referenced it in terms of um, having been through a pandemic and lots of different conflict in the world. This generation of students, this Gen Z, and personally I don't know why we started so late in the alphabet because what happens after Gen Z, right? It's like, do we go back to A? You know, like there's something kind of almost um, uh, apocalyptic about that, right? That it's, that it's Gen Z, right? So, but there, there are so many ways in which um, they are finding challenges. And I think what's top of my, my mind as a leader, artist, educator is how do I help students um, who are in a conservatory, who are very interested in becoming performers, navigate sometimes the, in, in, the incongruence that they're finding in the spaces that they're learning, that um, they understand that they, they, have certain, they have certain expectations in terms of the spaces in which they're engaging in pedagogy and performance that are not being met either by the artists that are brought in or even by their faculty sometimes. And I think this is one of the challenges that I find is really important to think about in terms of how do we help them reconcile their anxiety about gaining employment on graduation with being able to be in a process that is literally more about process than product. And how do they navigate that when they walk into a space with an artist who doesn't have the same kind of value systems that they have around pronouns and names, right? This is, these are some of the things I think that really, really can derail the, the performance process and these kind of learning experiences. I don't have answers. I just bring them up as, 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 as things to consider when we're bringing pedagogy and performance together. Um, I will say that, you know, what's, what's fascinating to me about what you brought up with the, the student's message about creating spaces of dance, you read the letter from the student, and, and the importance of the social and emotional learning that we understand the collaborative process in those spaces. Um, I'm not sure all dancers are feeling that in the spaces. I think it's, it's very particular to this generation, um, having been through the pandemic. Some of them, their parasocial relationships are more more profound for them than, than their actual relationships with, the, with other students. So I think these are just some things to think about and maybe it'll come up furthermore in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Can we give a little quick round of applause? <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> um, thank you, each of you, for bringing such like distinct and connected perspectives to the table and, and representing your institutions so beautifully also. I'm really struck by the, the how of, of all of your work and the programs you're trying to build, including where the problems and uncertainties lie. There's like 
know with like the the question of like how students can actually learn an, all the techniques that exist right and inhabit these dances I was thinking like how to teach like maybe the question is how to teach students how to learn right rather than the thing itself that they're learning right and the question Josh of um, artists in partnership rather than other language that's used on college campuses a lot, you know, that kind of shift in method um, of how artists enter a space also to me raises all these complexities around adapting to every single artist, right? And how does that then fit in with student expectations and faculty, ongoing day-to-day -day activity? Um, and Raphael, like this question of like, it's not about the goal. It is about actually being in the process and kind of in the soup together, you know, and in the mess together. Um, that's that's really beautiful. And I'm still processing, Julia, everything you said, but it's all in there, right? Um, so I don't know if there's a, there's a question in that, but I'm really struck by that as the challenge. And then the question of um, how students encounter that um, and sort of what world are they being prepared for <laughs> by moving through that, um, that how, right, in each of your spaces. I wonder if we might kind of go into, a, uh, this was a question I almost had for the end, but into this kind of future-oriented space. Um, what is the world that you imagine students are entering? And how has it changed over the course of you, you being in these positions? Um, um, what are you preparing them for? And, and how do they get there? Or how do you hope they might get there in the future? It's a big one, I know. I feel like it covers everything, kind of, doesn't it? Yeah. I can, I can speak. So um, being at a Research One university, the dancers at Kaufman um, have the opportunity, obviously, to, well, they have to, <laughs> whether they like it or not. They do, uh, they have, they do about 85% of their coursework in dance, and then the rest um, is in liberal arts that are, you know, they have to take a certain number of liberal arts. Um, the students that come to USC um, are, are very ambitious. Um, most of our dancers are doing minors at the same time. And what we are trying to do is not uh, set up these kind of dichotomies where, oh, you know, take that minor because if dance doesn't work out, you know, like we don't do that. We really try to say, look, we Kaufman is really dedicated to being this artistically daring, academically rig rigorous, incubator of embodied research practice and we want dance to be a part of your life throughout your lifespan if that's what you want. So we try to encourage them towards minors or majors that will, will allow them to think broadly beyond just, um, I talk to the students about a compass, right? You might think that you're headed due north towards that performance career, but the more that you allow yourself to go a little bit west, a little bit east, a little bit south, to expand what dance could be for your life, then, then you're going to have more options moving forward. Um, I would also say the dancers, particularly at Kaufman, and I know this is unique, they already have multiple outlets that they are working. Many of our dancers have 100,000 followers on Insta they're Instagramming, they're, they're, they're influences al influencers already. There's ways in which they're tapping into entrepreneurial activities that would never have even been in, on my con cognizance, right, in my consciousness in the past. So they're already setting those up and we really encourage those opportunities. Um, I think I mean, this about this um, this balance between really experiencing the school and the process, and at the same time, uh, you know, making a living when you get out of school and like uh, entering the, the field. Um, I think it's, and I think there is at least in France a stronger push now for all art schools to show and prove how they they can effectively. Um, you know, have students that are not unemployed when they finish, um, and, and and show that uh, quantitatively, which is not simple. Um, but um, I think um, there are, there are several things. One is that I don't think we can completely set aside that question uh, as it was maybe possible uh, a few decades ago, because uh, also if we want 
at least for example in Angers, to have people coming from different social backgrounds, they need to feel a certain level of security that they would, otherwise they cannot dedicate, even though we are, we are free. So it's also quite different from the US. They, they are not going to take a loan, they are not going to be in debt, but still they are going to, for, for, for us to, to for, for them, for us to attract a, a diverse uh, group, like people from really different social backgrounds, we need to reassure them that they will have a future after the, what we do. But we also want the school to be as open, as creative, as risk-taking as possible. And, and I also think if we really think of, of, of these schools as creative spaces, also if we take historically like the Bauhaus was, or maybe Black Mountain College or things like that. One of the questions we should be asking is not only do students find work, but which new ideas, which new processes, which new approaches students emerge from the school. So not only the students coming out of them, but the ideas, practices, aesthetics, whatever, like that, that, that were born there somehow. Um, and I feel like um, there, is, um, there is probably a w it, it's not a solution, but there is a way of... I, I also have the feeling that if we manage to create a school that, that is perceived by the field as a place where this is happening, it will give so much more uh, potential for the students coming out of that school. So there is a way in which focusing on the, the, the depth and the relevance of the, of, of, of the creative process that are going on there will actually help people find work in a very practical way. That a kind of strange synthesis in, in there. Another thing, I, I'm, and this is relating to more the, the issue of really new, you know, new political norms, new ethical norms, new social norms that are emerging and that are important. Um, for me, one of the questions is how do, we, how do we accompany that and how are we even like, uh, innovative in that? Um, I do feel like dance, a big problem in dance is that there can be a kind of um, guru figure of the teacher with a lot of, you know, uh, abuse in many ways that has taken place. So how do we, how do we allow for transmo transformative aesthetic and uh, artistic experience while being respectful of people and making sure <laughs> no abuse is going on? This is not always easy. Um, and I think, um, but I think there is also a, a kind of opposite risk to that, is that uh, the issues are so precise, like, you know, um, uh, gender, post-colonial, uh, global warming, I'm just like, uh, and, and they are the same for every uh, artistic institution in the world, in a way, that there is a risk, I think, a great risk of, of creating a new kind of academism, where these issues and the way to tackle them and the references that are used to tackle them are kind of already set for students. And we say, we, you need to work on these issues and you need to work on them with, uh, in a way that where you're trying to unsettle the norm in some way. And how, how are you creative in that setting? Because this is deeply alienating, I think. Like it's, it's not easy to emancipate from a school that asks you to be an emancipator. Like it's, it's, it's really, Problematic, like so, because in the school in Angers, we really try to have also um, not only performers coming out of school, but we are very like people that do make work and that become um, choreographers. Yeah, um, and and I think before people would go to a conservatory and the conservatory would be quite conservative, and it was very easy for them to rebel against that and to to go against, you know, I mean, not very easy at all, but it was, uh, th there was a kind of clear relation, uh, not so clear, but some kind of clear relationship between the school being the academy and, 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 and reinforcing conservative values uh, and, 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 and the students, the creator, the, the uh, kind of uh, fighting against that and finding her or their, his path. Um, and today the school is saying, well, you need to, 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 you know, to rethink things, to reshape, to re... A bit, I think also I was, <laughs> I, find, I find it quite inspiring, the, the, the kind of, uh, when the voice of the creative college that you were having. I think that voice, it's not easy to put a, 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 a few, an artist, someone that is trying to find their voice in that context, because 
um, how do you react to that? You know, uh, so I think that for me that is uh, that is also an issue. And connected issue. Sorry, I'm a bit long. I hope it's is that one of the demand that we get from students a lot, which I find interesting, is to is for um, for kind of. Uh, uh, for basis, they, they, we are asking them so much to, to 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 challenge things that they are telling us. But we actually need some core techniques. We actually need some core methodologies. We don't have those, and they don't like they. They are come, a lot of them come from high schools. They have no uh, methodology, no in critical thinking, in 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 in, in theories. They have no methodology really in learning, in making. It. <laughs> um, and so, for me, the big big question is how. Do we invent core methodologies that are not, uh, you know, conservative like they used to be, but that are also uh, really uh, empowering in a way that people can have basis on which they can stand to make their own work? Um, it makes me think of uh, one sentence uh, that I really like. Uh, um, I, I, um, from a roman of Marguerite Duras, Pluie d'été, that's the, the young boy, he says, I don't want to go to school but they, because they want to teach me something I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have this, I, I mean, related to what you said about the methodolo methodology and everything, I would really like to experiment that to invite some artists to teach uh, techniques that they don't know. For example, I would invite Noé to teach Bollywood, uh, Linda to teach ballet, Emmanuel Huyn to teach, uh, I don't know, uh, or oh, Stephanie, something you don't know. And that would create a platform for everyone to think what actually, what is teaching, what is learning. I think there's a big issue about that. Uh, just to question, question this, uh, the figure of the... Um, of the one who knows mm -hmm. and the one who doesn't know. So there's, I think there's really something to, and, and, and I think I might do it. Are you ready, everyone? <laughs> I'll do it with you. We could do, yeah. I, I think that where, who knows, I, that I don't want to go to school because they want to teach me something I don't know feels like also what professors are saying in the classroom when they're encountering their students. And the thing I think about is in an arts space, in a studio space, um, are, we, are there teachers and students or are there artists? Um, and what's the difference? Um, you know, and, and students today are, or the younger generation, I love that, that we don't call them students. Like I think about that a lot. Um, they're making, they're making in, in ways that that pushes the boundaries of what any generation that's trying to teach them certainly understands. I mean, I could all speak at Wesleyan, like our, the Center for the Arts Instagram is horrible, but our students know exactly what's wrong with it. Um, they don't want to help, but that's fine. Um, but it's, it is a beautiful thing to just wonder where the boundary between being an artist and being making, being, making doing, teaching, and where knowledge circulates. Um, feels really important there. And the technique, I mean, I think that's so important, like that that there are classes where you don't question that technique is important to actually learning a discipline, even if you decide to reject it later. Like, I, we, can, we can study biology, and then we can also refute its essentialisms um, at the same time. Um, and so how do we make space for both of those things? Um, it just, I'd love to, to be in a class where people are teaching what they don't know. Yeah, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to say also, I think um, the connection between technique and research and what research is, is not always made explicit in the classroom for students. And I think there is a disconnect talking about learning how to come up with methodologies. I think some there is a real performance as research, I think is an area that we all can really help students better understand, yeah. Yeah, um, I want to invite everyone to think of their question, and we're not going to have time for all of them, but if you have one, take a moment while I um, say one more thing, um, because I'm coming for you next. Um, but I'm, I'm really, thank you for saying that, um, Julia. Um, 
And I wanted to try to bring back in the question of performance, right? which is kind of partly part of the title of this talk. Um, and I'm also really inspired by what you said earlier, Raphael, about um, curiosity and how actually your, the program is also a product of your own curiosity as you continue to learn, right? That, that kind of maybe the, the question of the artist in these academic spaces kind of makes us grapple with that um, constant learning and curiosity and research and exploration um, as a kind of method, as a technique maybe even, right? Um, so I wonder if there's any last, and it doesn't have to be all of you that speak on this, but any last things you wanna say just about how performance practices themselves, maybe an example of how that has influenced your teaching or your curriculum that you're um, helping to create. Um, and vice versa, how, you know, if, if that's more applicable to your work, how um, the, the teaching and the, the shape of the program maybe has influenced your curatorial choices. And the frictions and possibilities within that, <laughs> as we've discussed. Maybe I'll just say something very quickly, which is, um, uh, no, what you said about uh, curating between performance versus visual arts and that you can't really curate a dance because it's not there with you when you curate it and it, it takes time. I think the time really stood out to me. Um, that I find that my encounter with students today is that they feel they need to have the answer now to the crisis for tomorrow. So it's not just about them growing up as artists. My students are, are worried about whether there's gonna be a world to live in tomorrow. So um, there's something about performance as discovery as like forcing a slowdown that feels really um, necessary to take time to learn things and to find our voice or however you want to put it, that feels really important. Um, and I lost my other thought, so I'll just let it go. That was, that was great. <laughs> Anyone else want to add to this? <clears throat> yeah. Any questions from our audience? Yeah. John, over there. Hi, thank you all for being here. Thank you also, Tara, for moderating this morning. Um, this question of looking for work after graduating has come up a number of times from each of you. Um, and I'm mindful that uh, the economies of the US and France are very different for what professional opportunities in dance look like. So I'm just curious to hear uh, very briefly, perhaps from each of you, what different professional orientations feel relevant to your students. Um, for example, I can imagine that the question of looking for work, performing with other choreographers might feel more relevant to certain student bodies than others. And, and then kind of in conjunction with that, or perhaps as an alternative, is there like a primary orientation of the program that you oversee professionally towards students, given the different economic realities that each of your programs are situated in? So um, because we're based in LA, there's an enormous amount of opportunity in commercial work. And I just use that term because that's what we use at Kaufman and we're not always comfortable with that term. Uh, but if you had to create a binary between the concert wor world and the commercial world. So we really work in our pedagogical and performance agendas that students are learning these multiple literacies working across these forms. Um, so we often will have students who came in as a concert dancer say, well, I think I'm a hip hop dancer now and I'm gonna go audition for Beyonce and they do. So, so we have dancers working with Beyonce, Doja Cat, VMAs, you know, they're also getting into Stadt Ballet Berlin and Ballet BC and Things. So it's kind of across the gamut. Um, but then there also are some that are like, you know, I just did four years of hard performance and now I want to go into dance therapy. So it's it's across the board, yeah. I think in France, I mean, in Angers, um, we have a very supportive system for uh, uh, performing art artists in France, like a kind of... Uh, uh, an employment that allows you to to work um, in an irregular way, but to have a, a stable income, and so we try that we try for the students to meet as many dance makers throughout their programs, and we tell them from day one that these are people that they might work with, or so they they tend to start to create a network in school. Um, 
uh, and and then when they come out, I think most of them will start working on specific productions with that. Much more in the concert world than the commercial world. They they, they on our, not on our side, uh, and they we also try to encourage them to start um, for if they are interested in that to make their own projects with each other also or people, sometimes people from previous, previous cohorts or, or later cohorts so this is something we would like to to, to push more in the coming years but to really I, I think this kind of ecosystem that can get generated from people and, and, and I think we, in France the flexibility of this artist status is very convenient because someone can you know, uh, work as a performer for someone and try doing a project and find some local or, or, or regional or national fundings for that and, and and kind of let it grow and see, see see where it takes them. So that's more kind of our situation, let's say. Anyone else want to speak to that at all of, of you two? Okay. No? Good. Okay. Yeah, Lauren. Hi, hi Tara, hi everyone. Um, thank you for this very stimulating panel. Um, my question maybe, yeah, kind of builds off of John's question and also Josh's comment, just that like students don't know if there's gonna be a world tomorrow to live in and um, kind of noticing a tendency also through my own work as a teacher and in institutions within education, this like mandate to produce successful individuals. Um, when it feels like at every moment we constantly are needing to be not just like better at failing, but better at like needing each other um, and being kind of incomplete with one another um, in order to kind of face the challenges of like, yes, let's like um, abolish the structures of the world, which might include educational <laughs> institutions <laughs> in order to um, make a world that will like better serve us um, or unmake the one that hasn't been, that isn't working like right now at this very moment. Um, so yeah, I guess I just wanted to like what is that negotiation between the kind of model of like making the successful individual and then the kind of like the need for networks of reciprocity to use the, the term of today's gathering? I, I like, I, I framed the, the liberal arts voice in an I for very deliberate reason. I mean, that, that's, that's, that is the myth that, that uh, the student body it's sort of like it's just in the it's in the soil at Wesleyan, like and many colleges. This idea of like we're so amazing and as individuals, um, uh, and I say that as a, a proud graduate of Wesleyan. Like you know, we all do. We've been there. It's good. It's like it can be wonderfully empowering. And I actually think there are some students whose voices really deserve that platform to feel like they're really being heard. And um, so maybe then to just fold this in, like I. I don't know, I haven't, no, I haven't been to your school, but I love the idea of faculty being temporary because it makes me think that the students then own the classroom. And I imagine that there are spaces where students then feel like this is my school and you're coming into my space and I can actually guide you through it. So that for me is the power then to John's question of like what it, we're training students in, in a performance pedagogy space is that kind of collective creation uh, and um, you know, Wesleyan is very different and the U.S. is a very different like job landscape. I, a lot of students at Wesleyan met major in the arts, but also like engineering or like, you know, um, poli sci or things like that. And they'll tell you like, I'm going to go become a lawyer and an actor um, because they really want like something that feels successful. But I guess the part that I can offer them is just like. Um, it's wonderful that I have this job. But by no means was this a direct shot out of college. Like I'm sure many artists, people who've worked in the arts, it's just wayward. How do you survive? You just do in some way. You like struggle, you struggle with other people. And that this myth that like you can only be an artist in order to be a successful artist, rather than like the fact that every artist I know is doing something else as well. And that sometimes you give up being an artist for years or days or an hour and, and then come back to it. Like that that also has to be part of what it is to, to re-script this idea of what success looks like, because it's so much about 
it's in the title, right? Professional, the professional symposium. Like, who are the professionals up here? I don't, I don't know like a professional. So something in that feels like it's answering your question. Hi. Um, there are qu questions from um, from France, in fact, and one message from Ashley de Yoyo uh, Saude from uh, Diverse Work, Houston, who um, is the respondent of this panel but couldn't travel yesterday. So here is the message uh, first, and I'll ask the question after. Many of you highlighted different levels of what I would understand as acts of care for artists. They lived experience, their time and their body in relation to building a practice. It's exciting to see everyone thinking about how art is not made in vacuum and that the work is related to real life, culture, people and places. It feels like there is a pedagogy practice that is allowing, allowing students to learning how to cultivate their own vocabulary in their work by being empowered to be who they are and where they come from. So from uh, Houston <laughs> to all of you. Um, and then there is a question from the uh, Choreographic Center um, in Rio La Pape. Um, for uh, Raphael about the Elan program. So um, Dorothée asked, uh, said, Elan seems like an incredible program. Is it a long-term program or does it have a definite period? Actually, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I hope it's uh, for long-term, but... Uh, uh, as I said, it's um, it's existing because of, of the foundings of Hermes. So it's uh, I, I I don't know, <laughs> but as a as a suite to what was said before the message before is I, I totally agree with what uh, what is said on us. So it's. Um, l learning how to learn also um, yeah to yeah to every young should be given the chance to to decide how he wants to learn actually and uh, so let's hope that Elan will uh, but it's up to Hermes and Catherine <laughs> and but I, I hope it's going to be a model also for yeah for other Firms or Messina, whatever. That's also the idea of this symposium. Huh? <laughs> yeah. 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 Iran, did you have a question? Uh, thank you so much. It's very inspiring to know that it's so many different institutions that thinks about all these things together in different way. Because you know, you as a human, you don't fit into. You have to find the perfect fit. It's like choosing a school for your child, you know. With that said, I, I, I wonder about science. Like, how, in these dance programs, are you studying cognitive science, sports science, how things... Because I remember as a student, I was like, I wanted to know what the sports people did in order to have their energy. And, um, you know, the body is a body, is a body. I bring... I will, and they... Uh, I'm saying that because it is the difference between technique and style. And when we confuse technique with style, it's really hard to undo. I teach at Yale and I have all kinds of, I have cognitive scientists, I have lawyers, I have engineers that I teach and I call it like research of self. And that is something that you all talk about somehow and to be given that opportunity. And I think, and for myself, I have had great help with reading about how the body actually functions. So when you do a tendu, it's not the style of a tendu, it's actually the function of the tendu on, on what kind of muscle you use 
And because I do think, I remember thinking that as a student too, I'm going to learn everything. So my palette is really rich. So if I have an idea, I'm not limited to my ability. So I just wondered about how science is influencing or if it's influencing your thought process about education in schools. Uh, in Angers, we have a partnership with the local, with the hospital, where there is a different kind of uh, people working on, um, like su surgeon coming to to kind of you know give give the students uh, um, s some information about about some of the things we know about the body. But I must say, I think often the questions we might have are so specific and so that there is often not, I find, uh, definite scientific answers to them. Like, especially, for example, with cognitive science, uh, it's such a young science also, and the studies are so numerous and sometimes on small cohorts. I mean, it's just like we have to be very, very careful with the, the robustness of the scientific data that are out there. For biomechanics, for uh, also cognitive science, it's like, you know, I think also the, the subtlety of the difference in, I don't know, in, in phrasing between, uh, I don't know, <laughs> different styles or different approaches. I, I, I think we are, like, the kind of, uh, the, the scientific data that we have on that are, are still quite, quite open and vague in, in what they can tell us. I, I, I have the feeling. Um, and I also think that, um, I don't know. I, I think we were talking quite a bit about the, the 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 variety and the diversity of approaches to movement and, and that that are out there, and I think there could be a little bit of a, an illusion that there would be a neutral, universal one that might be, for example, a scientific one, because that approach will be, you know, uh, grounded in a certain ideology uh, of. Cartesianism and so on. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, and so you cannot reduce, or you, I don't think there is a kind of, I mean, maybe there was a hope of that, for example, with lab annotation at some point, that there would be one true analysis of movement to which other approaches could be reduced. But I don't think that's the case. Like, that, on the contrary, you really have irreducible, different, funda like fundamentally different approaches to experiencing the body. And science is probably one of them. Science is one of the ways of experiencing and approaching the body, but it has to enter in dialogue with other ones. And I would argue cannot pretend to be, to claim knowing a truth about the body. And in fact, that is one of the very things we try to, so we have all these teachers coming and often they think they have some kind of truth about the body. So there's a ballet teacher and they think they, they have some, there is a, a somatic practitioner and they also think they have a kind of deep truth about, and they also, they all think they have some kind of deep truth about the body, and that other techniques are kind of styled, but their technique has some kind of truth. Um, and what we try to say also to the students is that, okay, when you're going to study this, you're really going to study a little bit exactly what you were saying, actually, about like you have to go in it and you cannot be overly critical as you study it because otherwise you're just not getting the experience out of it, right? Then we will ask you to be critical. Then we will ask you to take a stance, to distance, or, or, or if you, or to take a stance anyway. But um, we also ask the teachers to keep in mind that their, their expertise is valuable and that they do have an expertise that the students don't have. Like, let's be, like, like there is a kind of, it's not like everyone knows everything and has the same expertise, it's not true. Uh, but um, at the same time, this expertise is localized. It's an expertise in Bali, it's an expertise in, I don't know, Cunningham or this or that. And, and so it's not the truth about movement, it's not the truth about dancers as a person. And that's very, yeah, that's very important, I think, to, to, to keep that in mind. Julia, the last word is yours. Yeah, I just wanted to say, in, in, in this idea of the truth, that's where I would, I would offer the companion thought that in, in thinking of one's own truth in movement is to, is to drop 
back down into considering that as your methodology and your research, right? Rather than a truth, but then also being able to be explicit about that for the student, right? It, and yeah, this is a truth, or I feel that I hold this to be true, but it's because of this, this, and this that I've experimented and used as a methodology. And just to speak on a practical basis, also to your point, um, I think dance science, particularly in the United States, has some real deep history in terms, but it's also been a lot around ballet and contemporary. So I would say the work of Emma Redding, Dr. Emma Redding is really important, who left Trinity Laban and is now in Melbourne is really because she's looking at now bringing street dance. Like what does it mean to be dancing on these surfaces? What does it mean to be doing sight dance rather than doing studies always in a studio with the right kind of floor? So I think there are people out there that are expanding that kind of research. And then of course there's the huge container of looking at dance and ability, Parkinson's, neurodivergence, Down syndrome, you know, gerontology. I think that is just, we're just starting to get into those realms as a discipline. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll end there. We um, have one more Oh, question. I'm sorry. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Hi. Real quick, it's like a question slash observation. And it's in connection with what you just mentioned about um, the landscape of uh, the academia when it comes to street and club dance um, and in terms of representation and possibilities for you as an artist, as a street dancer personally, to project myself, for instance, in, into creating work in street dance or the new generation to be able to create as, um, work around those styles. And for me, um, going around teaching in different universities, um, I see there's something very like narrow um, into the, what is supposed to be dance, um, um, and everything is so based into Eurocentric forms. So as far as me recognizing myself in it and me being a teacher, going to places, teaching those dance styles, uh, it's hard to answer to the questions of the students like, okay, what's after that? You came here for a short period of time, so what are the possibilities for me? And my, the only example I can give them is I had to create opportunities for myself. And if I, could, if I had to wait for the educational system to do it, I would have never done what I was able to do, what I'm able to do now. Um, so, so it's just a he it's just super heavy, like going to those places sometimes, noticing that, okay, you want um, Afro-descent dance forms in those spaces, but I don't feel welcome in those spaces really. Thinking of the space in itself, like what, how the space looked like, the floor itself, having Marley, uh, which is extremely violent, and it's like, okay, having that floor means you're not welcoming me, you're welcoming certain Eurocentric forms there. Having the bar in the dance room, so which means having the bar means dance is that. So for me, entering those spaces feels already violent for my own body. So I'm thinking, how does that, how do you create, um, different perspective, different ways for those dancers to see themselves um, and not feeling framed into, okay, if I want to be a dancer, I have to do modern ballet and maybe street and club dance to feel a little bit more open to what's out there when you know, especially in the States, that most of the dance forms that exist and that was created here comes from the black community. Um, and there's like over 50 dance styles that's Af coming from here uh, that are not represented in those artistic institutions. Uh, for me, it's odd um, to see how we truly represent um, the art and many different artists, many young dancers that are doing those dance forms. I'm talking about over 50 dance forms that are not represented in those uh, high institutions. Um, so for me, like, how do you switch that and really create space uh, for people like me, <laughs> basically. Il y a la question de retravailler les imaginaires, and especially for young people. And I can tell you, it's a very concrete uh, my experience that. Uh, I am teaching ballet at the Conservatoire de Paris, which is a very, uh, it's an institution which is, which is very uh, concerned about what is excellence and what is to preserve the repertoire and the patrimoine. 
And uh, talking about the friction, about uh, uh, science and style, I had the, the, a big enjoyment uh, um, observing the, the stupor. The, surpri <laughs> the, the, the surprise, the stupor. In my students' eyes to see uh, a ballet teacher which is black. Uh, which is wearing uh, locks, voilà. And I think it's up to us also to play with uh, with um, with symbols, with uh, but that means also taking taking your your risk also because it would be easier just to the 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 voilà de de de, de continuer les modèles existants to, to, to continue with the voilà. existing models. Uh, but well, it was my my choice to voilà to to it's a detail but it's important. Uh, so, voilà, c'est une façon de, de, je pense, de, oui, de retravailler les imaginaires. And really, I'm still very uh, surprised to see uh, that young people are still and now uh, surprised to see uh, colored people. Uh, uh, dancing is one thing, but teaching it's another thing because it's. I'm sorry to remind this, but I was one of the first uh, black dancers in the Paris Opera. And I'm the first black, no, 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 no. But I'm the first black teacher also teaching ballet at the conservatoire. So it's, uh, it's on the way. I, I hope I responded to your, it would be easier if I was, wait. Okay. Thank you. When it comes to black dance forms in itself, um, represented by black people and teaching those um, for the kids that want to have a voice in those styles and express themselves professionally in those styles. Uh, the, presentation, the representation is deeply lacking. So but for me to force ourselves within Eurocentric forms, yes, it's a, it's a fight, it's an ongoing thing. Uh, so now, yes, in Bali, we see that happening more and more, which I'm happy about it, but this is still Eurocentric forms. So yes, but, that's, but yeah. I, I, I'm agree, I totally agree, but ballet could become also a black, uh, I, I don't know, it's, uh, there's something to be also, it, the, the um, ideology can be also transformed. Je ne suis pas pour l'essentialisation des esthétiques. So, I don't know if it's really, but I, I think we can also change our boundaries and what we, what we think is Afro, what is, uh, um, uh, yeah, but, uh, the ethnocentrism. The et ethnocentrism. Is there something to be, to be worked, I think? I just want to right. name um, that it is absolutely a challenge inside of the US. I'm not familiar with the United, the European context, but there are examples where it's changing, like Columbia College in Chicago, right, which has a really, has made a really big shift in the last 10 years to kind of ground the entire curriculum in, in Afro-diasporic forms alongside European forms. So there are examples that are emerging and it's a very new phenomenon, I think, but it is, it gives, it gives me hope. Yeah. Also at Kaufman, because it was set up to put essentially ballet and hip hop and other black vernacular forms and street down forms in conversation. However, I will tell you the story that when the building was built, every studio had Marley, right? So of course the faculty were like, what is up, you know? So immediately changed two floors. Now we have two floors that are wood, that are appropriate that, and, and safer for the dancers. They still have ballet bars on the wall, <laughs> you know. So it, it's 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 almost devastatingly slow, but it's happening. Yeah. yeah. I, just, I think it's there is there are lots of resistances to that, and it's going to be an, an ongoing work. I I do think that in 
friends. Uh, they are major companies of hip hop that are prominent in concert dance and that all hold also direct choreographic center. And so I don't, not to say that we have arrived at a situation that is satisfactory at all, but I think there is an inspiring generation that has already been there for a while uh, in, in, in hip hop in, 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 in France, I hope. And I also think there is new generation now that are even going further into that and even so. And I, I think we are definitely trying to accompany that and trying to uh, select, I think also as a school, what we try to do, what I can say is try to select really um, uh, like people coming from different aesthetic, people coming, uh, having a real diversity in, in the students and trying to empower these students not only teaching dance, but also uh, in terms of communication, in terms of how to produce works, in terms of how to direct institutions in the future, so that these people will direct institutions in, in the future and will change the landscape. That's, but that's a little bit long term, but that's also how we are trying to, to think it as a school. Thank you for that. And I love the example of the studio. Like, <clears throat> that it, it is this kind of constant revision you know, re-envisioning and revision of the literal spaces and the, as well as the curriculum. Um, and so I think we'll end on that note. There's so much more conversation to be had. So please um, have those conversations in the spaces in between. And um, we're here, you all are here. And I'm so glad, so glad to have this conversation and that it is such an intimate room also so that we can continue them afterwards. Um, I really, really appreciate all the questions and the deep interrogation of these like constantly shifting uh, formations that were in um, in education. Thank you, everyone. Maybe we'll take um, six minutes um, and then we'll come back here um, to listen to Linda and Alan.